so I think we can start. <clears throat> so I'm very happy to introduce Roberto. So Roberto Calandra, well, he's a friend since seven years ago, probably. Uh, and now he's a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. He did the post, uh, he, sorry, he was a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Berkeley Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Laboratory, working with Sergey Levine. He obtained a PhD from TU Darmstadt under the supervision of Jan Peters and Mark Desenroth, a master in machine learning and data mining from the Aalto University in Finland, and a bachelor in computer science from the University uh, of Palermo in Italy. His research interests uh, focus on the conjunction of machine learning and robotics. And so this is what they are conferencing on ro robot learning. Uh, and he's currently working on deep reinforcement learning, model-based control, tactile sensing, and Bayesian optimization. And today he's going to discuss about data efficient optimization with Bayesian optimization. Thanks, Roberto, for being here. And yeah, we can start. Thank you, Francesco, for the uh, introduction. And uh, uh, thank you to all the organizers for organizing such event and for inviting me. I think it's really awesome. Uh, and you know, uh, welcome everyone, uh, I guess, to this lecture. Um, here in California, it's early in the morning. I know that you are or late in the afternoon, so you'll be tired. I'll try to keep it, you know, short to the point. And uh, I'll take questions at the end. I know that uh, this is sort of the format. So um, the talk of today is going to be about uh, data efficient optimization using the Bayesian optimization specifically. And the slides are, uh, are also online if you want to see them sort of high resolution in case you know, video breaks or anything. So the, the goal of the talk uh, that I'm going to give you uh, today um, there are a few points that I really sort of want to, you know, highlight that this is what I'm explicitly trying to, to do. And the first one is that I would like you to walk away from this lecture by having a good understanding of how Bayesian optimization works. What are the components? What are the bits and pieces? How they interact with each other? The second goal is that I'd like you to understand and be able to recognize uh, in which problems uh, or applications it's appropriate to use Bayesian optimization in, and in which one is not because you know uh, the limitations wouldn't make it uh, so efficient. And the third point is that I'd like ideally you to, to be so familiar with the, with the notation, with the uh, sort of with the general ideas behind Bayesian optimization that ideally you should be able to pick up a, a, you know, a research topic, a research papers and essentially be able to understand uh, just at the end of this uh, lecture. So let me start by saying why Bayesian optimization. And uh, to do this, I'm going to show you a, a example in robotics, uh, which is sort of my field. And this is a real example. We, I was working on this during the beginning of my PhD in 2013. And what we have here is that we had a bipedal robot, uh, which, uh, which is shown here in the figure. Uh, which was a super nice system. It was an interior quasi-passive dynamic walker, which are type of robots that can walk really, really fast. Uh, and we had a controller that was designed by uh, a, a previous PhD student from biomechanics that could in theory uh, have the robot walking uh, very nicely. And sort of, you know, our goal was to uh, try to walk as far as possible we could with this robot as fast as possible. And, um, we essentially just just had to uh, to find the right parameters to make it work, and you know we wanted to collect some data, which sounded really easy and nice in, in you know in theory, and at the same time there were a couple of issues, uh, sort of complexities in in collecting this data because every time we would repeat an experiment with the same set of parameters with the same controller, the outcome would be slightly different because. Uh, sometimes the robot would fall down after, you know, five steps, maybe after six, you know, it's a little bit of stochasticity. And at the same time, every time that the robot would fall down, uh, the motors on the knees would essentially have very strong uh, forces applied. And typically a motor would break after a couple of hundreds, uh, you know, falling downs, uh, which means that every time that we had to replace a motor, we essentially had to start from scratch 
uh, the optimization because it's also, you know, on almost completely different mechanical system. And, and this means that we need to start again optimizing and finding a new set of parameters. And we essentially had this idea of, okay, how do we tune the parameters of this controller? And initially, you know, we started looking at traditional optimization methods. And the first one was, you know, manual PhD student tuning, uh, where the idea was that, you know, Roberto just will spend two weeks of time uh, by fiddling with the parameters, understanding roughly how they influence. And after two weeks of me trying this, um, I essentially came back to, uh, to Mark, my supervisor at the time, and I was like, Mark, I have absolutely no idea how to tune these parameters. I tried everything I can and nothing is working here. So let's start using some actual optimization algorithm. And we started looking into other alternatives uh, like grid search, um, uh, which unfortunately wasn't really able to scale uh, to the set to the number of parameters that we had, which was already quite small, it was only eight, but grid search was not capable uh, because it's essentially scale exponentially. Uh, another one was random search, which is um, proven to be better than grid search, uh, both theoretically and, and empirically, but still required too many evaluations. We knew that 200, sort of our budget of 200 was not uh, was not uh, large enough to uh, actually try random search successfully. Uh, another approach was gradient descent, which is very, very commonly used in, uh, in, in many algorithms. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't have gradients of the, uh, of the reward with respect to, of the, of the objective function with respect to the parameters, which means that we cannot apply gradient descent uh, unless we start doing really uh, expensive things. And finally, evolutionary strategies, which is also another type of a global optimization algorithm, which is very common, but also this type of algorithms uses typically thousands of evaluations. So what can we do? And in practice, all of the algorithms that we would look at turned out to be impractical for this problem. And sort of what we, what we learned out, out of this and sort of what I'm going to argue in this talk is that Bayesian optimization is actually the right tool for these type of problems. So let's start a little bit from the notation. This is uh, the standard notation that people in uh, optimization use. And what we have here is that we have an objective function f, uh, which is the, the objective function that we want to either minimize or maximize, in this case, minimize. And then we have a set of parameters uh, x, which are the actual parameters that we want to, to optimize. These are variables that we can control and we essentially want to find out which one is the best one. And at the end of the whole optimization problem, uh, we will get essentially, uh, we can assume that we will get sort of our optimal uh, set of parameter or optimized set of parameters, which is uh, X star, which is sort of what, you know, what we're going to use in our, uh, and deploy in our real system at the end. And for the sake of this talk, we will typically assume that uh, the parameters that we want to optimize are continuous parameters, but uh, a lot of the same sort of notation and, and, and algorithms I'm going to present uh, in theory also work with discrete um, uh, sort of parameters. Now, there are um, very several very important aspects uh, when we look at the objective function that we want to optimize. Uh, and it's important that we sort of have a bit of an understanding of what is uh, crucial. Now, something that is very important when considering the objective functions is whether we are considering an objective function which has a single minima, uh, for example, that is convex versus if it has multiple minima. Uh, and a lot of sort of real world problems we know that might have multiple minima and, and this makes things more complicated, of course. Um, another important aspect is whether the objective function is, is zero order or is a higher order. Zero order means that we only can measure essentially the, the objective function at the points that we're evaluating, but we don't have gradients. While first order means that we have gradients, second order means that we can also compute Hessians and so on. Um, then whether the function is, is noiseless or whether it's stochastic. Thus evaluating all the same set of parameters several times brings you always to the same, uh, you know, to the same cost function, to the same objective function or not. This is, um, depends whether you know, it's in the real world or not. And finally, whether uh, the objective function is cheap 
uh, where we can you know potentially evaluate thousands or millions of um, um, of sort of points or whether it's an expensive evaluation where we actually need to be very very careful in selecting where because we have a very limited budget potentially of thousands or hundreds of uh, points and just to uh, sort of be very explicit uh, the first class of problems that we see on the left this is the nicest and easiest problems that we can find in in optimizations uh, these are problems that uh, we know how to solve extremely well using traditional algorithms, for example, gradient descent. And to large extent, this is, for example, why you know, a lot of uh, current machine learning algorithms are efficient. It's because we know how to optimize them well. Um, instead, the class of problems that we have on the right, this is the sort of hardest type of problems that you can ever uh, have. Uh, and these are the ones where uh, specifically, we are interested in, in using Bayesian optimization, and this is sort of the class of problems where uh, we will get the most benefit out of it. So some of the examples that I typically um, sort of show to people um, are oil drilling, uh, quite surprisingly, uh, you know, where if you want to find oil, uh, every time that you want to uh, dig in a different place, this this requires you to essentially hire a crew of people, spend several millions of dollars to, you know, to buy all the equipment and start drilling, and takes you weeks of time to actually, you know, figure it out. Okay, is there is there oil here or not? So some of the very early version optimization uh, algorithms were actually heavily used in in oil drilling. Um, another field is drug design, where again there is a very high cost in uh, uh, in sort of uh, making an experiment and you want to take really the best, make the best out of this small budget of, you know, uh, potential candidates that are going to uh, try drugs. Um, design and manufacturing of physical uh, physical object is somewhere where also um, Bayesian optimization is largely, is largely used. Uh, also in optimizing, for example, um, uh, F1 cars. Uh, and, and robotics, which is sort of my, my own field, uh, is also very popular Bayesian optimization. Uh, finally, since this is a machine learning summer school, um, a field that might be very relevant for, for many of the participants is hyperparameters optimization. And I'd like to spend sort of maybe one more second on this. Because as, uh, as a lot of the machine learning algorithms that we use essentially grow more and more, more complex and the models grow grow larger and, and sort of more difficult uh, to, to optimize, um, actually using uh, automatic algorithms such as Bayesian optimization is something that uh, is, is growing a lot and sort of uh, is getting a lot of uh, uh, impact really in the, in the machine learning community. Uh, you know, if you take a deep neural network, you're gonna have hundreds of parameters like learning rates, number of layers, batch size, and it's for humans, it's sometimes very difficult to understand really what is the correlation between these parameters and what is the best one. So a lot of the state of the art results that we see nowadays are really essentially depending from the fact that we have good hyperparameters optimization algorithms like Bayesian optimization or more advanced version of this. Um, and just to point it out, there is really a vibrant community which is dedicated to essentially automatically tuning these cyber parameters and you can typically uh, find it under the name of AutoML. So let's get down to the um, to the to the real part. So how does Bayesian optimization work? And the intuition behind Bayesian optimization is actually very very simple. Um, the the intuition is here is that uh, while many optimizers typically only make use of local informations uh, to, to make the decision. So for example, uh, in, in gradient descent, essentially when you select the next you know, set of parameters that you want to, to evaluate, this decision is only made based on where you currently are and the gradient that you evaluate in that point. But you essentially are not making any use of the, of the previous you know, points and set of parameters that you evaluated. And the fact that you are sort of making this um, very local decision seems somehow uh, to be uh, inefficient because you are you're really not making full use of the informations that you had in the past. So 
the, the intuition behind the operation optimization is that we instead want to replace these uh, local uh, informations by, by using the full set of knowledge that we, we have collected in the past. And this means that in practice, uh, we are going to select the next point by, by trying to uh, sort of distillate the knowledge of all the past uh, tuples of uh, uh, parameters that we evaluated and corresponding objective function uh, value uh, of, of this set of parameters. And the question is, okay, but how do we do this in practice? And the idea is that we essentially are going to learn a surrogate model uh, F tilde, uh, which is going to try to approximate uh, F, F of X, our originally objective functions that we don't really know, that we are not the sort of, we don't have in a, in a mathematical form. And in the moment when we can essentially learn a surrogate model, uh, which ideally is going to, uh, you know, to be perfectly representing how F behave, uh, then we can essentially replace the original optimization problem with a new one where we are now going to uh, maximize or minimize uh, instead our surrogate model. And uh, in practice, this is sort of the typical flaw that you see in invasion optimization, where the idea is that at every iteration, you're going to learn a response surface from past uh, data. Uh, and then based on this response surface, you're going to select the next a set of parameters to evaluate. You're going to then take this uh, set of parameters that you optimized virtually, and you're going to really execute it on the physical system you are going to collect new data and then you're essentially going to start again from scratch the next iteration. And visually, this is gonna look something like this. Now, in these figures, our true objective is, is the blue line and this unknown uh, a priori. However, we have a data point that we have measured in the real world, which is this red dot. And, and what we can do is that we can essentially train our response surface in this particular case, a Gaussian process and initially this response surface is essentially going to be very uh, non-informative because it doesn't, you know, it only has a data point. It doesn't really know what's going on in the rest of the objective function. So it's essentially just gonna have some large uncertain interval uh, almost everywhere and, and only, you know, being a little bit more accurate there where we have this point. But based on this, we can already select a, a next point to evaluate. And as we collect more data, uh, every time we are also uh, improving the sort of uh, collecting more evidence that we use to train our response surface uh, so that it's more accurate and more accurate. And as we go along, we essentially uh, are gonna get a, a response surface, which is gonna get more accurate. And as it gets more accurate, then also the points that we're going to select are going to be more meaningful and more informative uh, of the underlying process until at some point we essentially are going to converge to the, uh, to the optima or the, you know, very close to the optima because the, um, because the response surface is effectively accurate enough that we know what's going to happen in the real world. And um, this open uh, a number of questions. The first question is how do we learn the response surface? What form should the res uh, response surface take? And, um, the idea here is that the, surf, uh, the surrogate model, also called response surface, um, it needs to accurately represent and ideally generalize uh, the, the underlying functions uh, based on the available data. So given the data set uh, of, of previous objective functions uh, of uh, parameters and corresponding objective functions, we really want to have this F tilde being as close as possible to the real F. And in theory, uh, the, the Bayesian optimization is fairly agnostic to what model uh, you, you want to use in order to solve this regression problem. Uh, but in practice, there have been uh, several models uh, that have been sort of more heavily used in the, in the literature. And uh, initially polynomial functions were very, uh, very common. Uh, but as we, we got better machine learning models and tools, uh, people started using more uh, other, more complicated machinery like uh, random forest, Bayesian neural network and Gaussian processes. And Gaussian processes in particular 
are by far uh, the most commonly used model um, at the moment um, for for a number of reasons and i will i will sort of uh, briefly explain you why um, now i assume that uh, you don't have much knowledge of gaussian processes so i will also give a very short introduction to gaussian processes uh, really like a minute so gaussian processes are a very flexible Bayesian regression method. And the main idea here is that we uh, essentially are gonna have a Gaussian process uh, being a distribution of our function, uh, fully identified by, uh, by a mean and a kernel. And the, the idea is that this is a probabilistic model. So effectively, uh, what we are modeling here is that we, we have a um, sort of our f of tilde, plus some Gaussian noise, uh, because the, the Gaussian process can effectively represent uh, noise uh, if the noise is Gaussian. And um, once we have this formulation, essentially we can, I, I, I'm gonna skip entirely you know, how you actually derive this, but just want you to roughly understand you know, what's the outcome, is that you can effectively, after you train this model, uh, you can use it to, to predict distributions, uh, Gaussian distributions for arbitrary input. And this is effectively computed as a, as a Gaussian output, um, which uh, where you essentially have a mean and, and you have, uh, which is corresponding to the kernel ridge regression. And, and then you have some variance. Uh, and all of this is essentially a kernel machine. So you, you are just going to multiply the kernel uh, and transpose it and you know, multiply it again. So um, mathematically, this is very, uh, very well, it's fairly simple. It's fairly well understood, uh, although there are several interpretation of what actually means. And if you're interested in more on this, I strongly recommend uh, the Rasmussen book about Gaussian processes. Um, but sort of to give a more concrete intuition of this, uh, what's really happening is that if you assume that we have some function uh, x and y and we have several data points, um, in practice, there, are, there could be several explanation uh, of, of functions that could fit this data. Because you know, this blue curve, for example, uh, Francesco could say, I think that this blue curve is the actual, is the perfect function to fit this data. And he's right. Uh, but Martina might ask, say instead, no, no, this green one is instead the one that uh, I think it's the right one. And you know, to some degree, all of these are, are reasonable and, and somehow uh, correct uh, solutions. But as you get more and more uh, sort of hypotheses, you will see that um, effectively, as long as the, all of these hypotheses come from from a same family of, of classes, family of functions, uh, you will be able to sample an infinite number of functions and then collect statistics over this infinite number of samples. And uh, what you can do is that if you assume that these functions are Gaussian, Gaussianly distributed, you will at the end have some Gaussian distribution where between point you will have uncertainty because you don't really know exactly which one uh, of the functions is correct, but you know that the sort of farther away you are from a point, the higher your uncertainty will be. While if you're very close to a point, essentially all the uh, potential hypotheses uh, will sort of collapse to, to something that is uh, fairly, you know, fairly certain. And something that is very important in Gaussian processes is the choice of the, uh, of the family of classes from which uh, we essentially draw hypotheses. And this is called a technically covariance function. And the covariance function, the, by far the most commonly used one, uh, at least for, for trivial problems is the square exponential. And uh, the idea is that uh, essentially this, uh, this kernel this covariance function uh, define the general class of functions that can be represented by by uh, by our Gaussian process, and this uh, this kernel has a number of parameters, uh, often called hyperparameters, which can be uh, automatically optimized during the training time at training time when you train the Gaussian process, and um, typically um, this can be done either by using 
uh, marginal likelihood uh, approximation, a map estimate, or by doing some more fancy uh, numerical integration, which is technically more appropriate, but is also uh, can be much more complicated because of the challenges of of the you know of the actual machinery and sampling and so on. And again, you know, if you are interested more on this, I would recommend you to sort of uh, have a look at the Rasmussen book. But all of this was just to give a, a very brief uh, introduction. And, and this led me to say, okay, what are the advantages of Gaussian processes and what are the cons? Why are people uh, still using them instead of just using, uh, you know, fancy uh, deep neural networks? And the reason is because um, mathematically, uh, one reason is because mathematically Gaussian processes are fairly well understood. You have fairly good understanding and guarantees over you know, what cases they would work. Um, a second reason is because they provide calibrated uh, uncertainty. So you do have an understanding of what it means if, uh, you know, if your model tells you I'm so and so uncertain, you can have essentially some sense of what this means. Um, another really nice property is, is that it's very easy or fairly easy uh, to specify priors of the underlying function. So if you want to assume that the function, for example, uh, has some particular Lipschitzian smoothness, uh, you can do this by just choosing the appropriate kernel and by you know, tuning the parameters accordingly. And overall, um, and this is sort of the high level um, uh, sort of real advantage is that Gaussian processes are extremely good at modeling functions in, in low data regime. And uh, this is very powerful because in Bayesian optimization, we will in most of the cases be working on, on low data regime where we might have only tens or you know, maybe hundreds of, of data points, but not millions, uh, which might be necessary to train uh, you know, accurate uh, neural networks. Uh, on the other side, Gaussian processes are very difficult to scale to high dimensional input space. And this is the reason why they are typically uh, only used with problems that are less than 20, 30 dimensions. Uh, and they're computationally expensive because they, the training is essentially uh, cubic with respect to the, uh, to the data points. Um, finally, the, the quality of the model, um, it's still fairly dependent from the uh, choice of the kernel. And this means that in practice, they still require quite a significant amount of expert knowledge uh, in order to, uh, you know, to really get the best out of this, uh, out of, of the regression. So now that we have a, an understanding of what type of, you know, response surfaces we can uh, we can use. Let's have a look now that we have a model. How do we select the next uh, the next parameters to evaluate? And this is really the part uh, which um, you know that it, it's the core, sort of the heart of Bayesian optimization. So, how do we select the next parameters to evaluate? Um, the the way that we select the next uh, uh, the next parameters is through what is called uh, acquisition function. And the idea here is that we are going to have this acquisition function uh, alpha, which essentially is going to take the model that we, um, our response surface that we previously trained, and, and it's also going to take you know, all the data points that we, we have seen in the past. And this then uh, through an optimization, uh, a minimization or maximization, it's essentially going to return us the data points, the, the next uh, data point that we want to evaluate uh, onto the physical system. And the, again, the high level intuition here is that uh, an acquisition function uh, needs to strike some balance between exploration and exploitation, which is something that you will also see uh, tomorrow in, in a lot of the reinforcement learning uh, sort of theory and, and algorithm. And this is very important because in the, when we sort of are trying to, to do decision making and optimization, um, if we have too much exploration, we will typically keep trying parameters which are, you know, maybe we have a strong feeling that they're not going to be very useful, they're not going to do a lot, uh, but because we are just exploring, you know, we are sort of, we'll keep trying. 
On the other side, uh, if we have too much exploitation, uh, the system will see a point and say, okay, I like I actually like this point and we'll sort of keep sampling there without really having an idea of how this point is doing with respect to the general, uh, you know, the general objective function. And maybe if you would just try something else, you would actually get better. So in both extremes, um, we see empirically that algorithms uh, tend to suffer and performance will, will decrease. So uh, something that is very important is how do we strike uh, the right balance between exploration and exploitation. And uh, in, in batch optimization, um, you can think of, uh, of this trade-off between exploration and exploitation uh, by, um, by essentially thinking it in terms of mean uh, of the response surface and variance of the response surface. Now, the mean of your, of your response surface is essentially telling you what is the belief uh, of the um, sort of, 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 our, of, our, of our model. And it, this is typically uh, or often uh, sort of associated with, uh, with exploitation. This is the things that we know. This is the known part of, of the known. Um, on the other side, you have the variance or uncertainty and the uncertainty is essentially associated typically with exploration. Because if we now start sampling points where we are not sure, what we are doing is essentially to, uh, to explore more. And in the, um, in the literature, uh, there, there have been a very large number of acquisition functions that have been uh, proposed. Um, some of the most commonly used are expected improvement and, and more recently classes of entropy search algorithms. Uh, but the one that I want to sort of show you uh, because it's, it's very intuitive and uh, sort of can give you a, the right idea is, is actually upper confidence bound. And what upper confidence bound is doing is that it's literally just uh, essentially taking the mean, subtracting some uh, rescaling of the variance. And this is essentially, here you can really see the trade-off because this parameters beta is essentially telling you how much should I care about the mean, so my, my exploitation, and how much should I care about my exploration, so uh, the variance, how much should I sample points that I've never seen uh, sort of before. And uh, in most of the other acquisition function, the trade-off is a little bit more subtle, is, is a little bit more hidden sort of in the, in the, in the math, but in, for upper confidence bound, it's actually very, very evident that there is this trade-off. Um, now, it's important to, to notice that uh, although some of these acquisition function uh, have sort of are more commonly used, there is no, no real golden bullet. So um, if you have a, uh, you know, a problem of which you, you don't really know a lot of structure, you don't really know a lot, it's typically very difficult to to predict which acquisition function is going to behave best uh, and which one is striking the right balance between exploration and exploitation. So um, this is to some degree still uh, an open question in research and people have been trying also very fancy things like ensemble of acquisition function where you sort of ask different acquisition function where they would go and then sort of try to summarize uh, what, you know, what they're doing. Uh, but there is really no, no ultimate solution. Uh, very often people start from something reasonable like expected improvement. And you know, if necessary, move on something more fancy like predictive entropy search. Now, um, we have seen uh, that now that we have the acquisition function and we sort of know roughly how the acquisition function works. Um, the next question is how do we optimize it? Because we started from our original, you know, optimizing the objective function, then we moved on to optimizing the response surface. And now we are essentially are at the points where we are trying to optimize the acquisition function. And the sort of optimizing the acquisition function is by itself also a challenging problem. It's a challenging optimization problem. So something that very naturally would uh, sort of occur to people is, you know, what have we gained by essentially changing introducing all this machinery of uh, response surface and acquisition function. What 
what what's the purpose and the advantage here is that this uh, optimization optimization of the acquisition function is actually a completely different problem uh, in terms of properties uh, compared to the original problem um, based on the taxonomy that we briefly discussed before uh, optimizing the acquisition function is no longer a stochastic uh, function is is no longer a stochastic problem because the acquisition function is 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 the term fully deterministic there is no noise here moreover it's no longer a zero order uh, optimization because in many cases depending from what is the response surface that you use you can actually differentiate it and you can now compute gradient and even hessian in some cases and finally, it's uh, optimizing, evaluating this acquisition function is no longer expensive because it doesn't require you to go out in the real world and you know actually dig for for oil anymore. Uh, but it only requires the the model to essentially to be simulated into uh, in, into your computer. And although this is computationally intensive, uh, it's still much cheaper than you know go, going out in the real world and doing something. So. In theory, uh, any global optimizer can be used uh, to optimize the acquisition function. Uh, although in practice, uh, what people very uh, commonly use uh, is some type of global optimizer uh, initially to get a good estimate of the solution, for example, CMAES, uh, and then some uh, essentially followed by a first order optimizer like gradient descent to really refine and sort of numerically find the, the best uh, solutions. So sort of to bring everything back together, uh, the way that uh, Bayesian optimization typically looks like the final algorithms is something like this, where we, uh, if we have previous data that we uh, you know, evaluated in the real world of tuples of parameters and uh, objective values, we can use them. We can put them inside uh, our data set D. If we also have priors about the shape of the response surface, we can also use it. And then we train a response surface f of a tilde from, from this data. We optimize the acquisition function alpha, uh, which is essentially making use of the, of the response surface internally to simulate what would be the, uh, the performance of the system. And once we, fi we find the optimal solution of this simulated uh, um, sort of system, we go out in the real world, we evaluate it, we collect data. And now that we refine our belief, we can essentially uh, you know, restart the process and retrain our model that represents our belief and so on. So going back to our robot, the way that this looks like uh, in the real world is something like this, where uh, initially your uh, objective function uh, you know, um, in, in our case, this robot was falling down after a couple of steps. And after about 20 iterations, the robot learned how to sort of, you know, start walking, make a few timid steps, but it was still falling down. And after, uh, at the end of the whole optimization, which was uh, about 80 trials for an eight, eight dimensional system, uh, the robot was essentially capable of walking uh, as fast as the mechanical system could. And in this particular case, it was an extremely stable set of parameters. It was working for walking for more than three minutes without you know, falling down. At some point it even recovers. And this was extremely cool because we could essentially cut down from you know, two weeks of real world experiments down to roughly six hours of automatic experiments where, you know, you don't need a human to actually think about what's the next set of parameters. It's all the decision making is sort of automatic. So, and it's important if we actually look at the, you know, at the model and, and sort of the learning curve, uh, this is how Bayesian optimization will often look like. And let me, let me explain a little bit. What we have here is that we have in red, these are the values that we actually measured in the real world. And in blue, instead, there is the prediction of the model of how, you know, if, if we evaluate this set of parameters, uh, this is how the model think it will perform. And what we can see is that initially, there is a very large discrepancy between the model 
and, and the actual performance. So the model is overly optimistic. It's always saying, okay, this set of parameters, I think is gonna do great. And then tries it in the real world and it's actually doing very poorly. But after about uh, 80 trials, the model is essentially really catching up with the, um, with the underlying process. And now can really tell you, okay, I know, I sort of know what's going on and, and now all the predictions are actually spot on. And in, moreover, um, it's actually capturing the uncertainty of the system and the sort of stochastic nature of the system by having this large sort of uncertainty, which really captured the stochastic. Now, another nice thing about this is that since we have models, um, this also allow us to some degree to gain insight about the problem that we are uh, trying to, uh, to solve. So what we noticed uh, by uh, you know, looking into the model, for example, was that there was a asymmetry between the left and right hip uh, of about five degrees. So the optima for the right hip was at 205 degrees and, and for the left hip was about 200. And you know, from a design point of view, this is something puzzling. You know, why, why would you have a asymmetry in the, of five degrees between the legs in the optimal parameters? And, uh, and a posteriori, this actually, uh, after a lot of thought, makes sense. It's because the robot is working in circle. So the arc that the two legs are doing is actually slightly different. And, and this is essentially a knowledge that, uh, you know, the model is actually learning and it's incorporating and it's visually there. So at any point as a, as a designer, you can essentially take this model and try to unpack what's the insight that the model learned, which is very, very powerful. Now, sort of moving toward the end of the, of the lecture, um, there are a lot of extension of Bayesian optimization. The one that I, I I sort of introduced uh, so far is the standard classical single objective Bayesian optimization. But in practice, people have done all sorts of extension of, of the standard framework. Um, some you know, constraint optimization, extension for multitask, where you have several tasks that might be correlated, um, robust optimization, safe optimization, batch optimization, where you can sample several points at the same time, for example, if you have multiple robots that you can use. Um, but I, I wanted just to very quickly point out two of them, which are actually very uh, useful in the real world. And I sort of wanted to give you a rough intuition of uh, how they work and why they're useful. And these are contextual optimization and multi-objective optimization. So the example of contextual optimization is that uh, if we go back to our example of the robot, the robot learned how to walk on a flat surface. But in, in many cases, you might want to have a robot that is capable of walking uh, you know, with inclines of different uh, angles. So how do we, uh, you know, how do, we do this? Uh, and it's important to know that you know, in, in, for real world examples, the incline is actually not a controllable variable. You, know, you are in some environment, this is the incline that you, you see but you cannot really control it uh, from an engineering perspective. And the way that contextual Bayesian optimization is formulated uh, is that you know, if we take the traditional Bayesian optimization, we now are going to introduce an additional variable C, uh, which is the context. And the context is, is a variable that we cannot control, but that we can observe. Now, this is an extremely common case because in, in the real world, uh, there are a lot of cases where we can observe more information that we can control. And um, I don't have time to dig into this, but it's actually becoming much closer this formulation to what uh, RL is and sort of what the Markov decision process is. Um, from an algorithmic, per algorithmic perspective, this requires only minimal changes to the algorithm because it only requires us to have a response surface, which now also include the context as an as a input variable um, and, and then changing in the optimization of the acquisition function, uh, essentially introducing some constraint so that uh, when we actually want to choose the next point to evaluate uh, or the, you know, the set of parameters to execute, this is going to be constrained by uh, the context that we are currently seeing uh, in the real world. And um, Again, to give an example, uh, this time on a separate, on a different robot, 
uh, here we had a um, uh, uh, micro exapod a few years ago. Uh, and in simulation, we essentially uh, show that we can train the exapod to walk at three different inclines, for example, at five, 10, and 15 degrees of incline. And then we can generalize uh, at, at uh, execution time. We can essentially take any incline, for example, at seven or 13. And the robot, because of the model, is essentially be able to uh, to generalize to these other inclines that were previously unseen and still have very nice and smooth performance uh, that sort of um, generalize to these unseen cases. Um, another uh, very interesting case is the case of multi-objective, which is also something that we often see in the real world. Now, what if instead of just caring about how fast the robot walks, uh, we actually care also about energy efficiency? And specifically for working robots, we know that there is a trade-off. You know, the faster you go, typically the more energy you, you are going to need. So how can we make this trade-off? How can we optimize both of them at the same time? And multi-objective is an extremely, extremely useful um, sort of framework in practice. And unfortunately, it's a little bit fuzzy because it requires you to minimize multiple objective functions at the same time. But it's really unclear what this means. And um, the way that uh, typically multi-objective optimization is tackled is by thinking in terms of Pareto front. So if you in, thinking in terms of trying to understand what is the optimal uh, trade-off curve between two objective functions, and essentially once you identify this trade-off, then as a human designer, you can decide at running time, at ex execution time, which one is the set of parameters from this Pareto front that you want to execute. And for Bayesian optimization specifically, there are a couple of ways to do this. Um, and the general idea is that you want to essentially scalarize multiple objective into, into a single one, uh, so that once you can move this back to a single objective optimization, then you can use the traditional uh, sort of machinery. And one way to scalarize several objective functions into one is by using, for example, a Chebyshev scalarization. I, I'm sorry, I will not have time to go through this. Um, another way is to use, um, uh, is, is to use upper volume, uh, uh, which is also a very compelling uh, way. Uh, but again, this is for, for next time. Um, but I wanted to give you an example. And again, going back to the, uh, to the working uh, micro robot, we essentially tried multi-objective optimization. And what you can see is that you can see different trade-off between speed and power. Uh, so for different, these are different uh, classes of, uh, uh, of CPG generators. And what you can see is that as a human designer, if you overlap them, you now have a clear winner, the dual tripod, which uh, if you want to go as fast as possible, uh, this is actually going to use less power than the other solutions uh, until you reach about 0 0.7 uh, centimeters per second. And at that point, there will be a different uh, gate, the ripple, which actually become more, more energy efficient. And as a human designer, it's sort of really powerful to be able to see this and sort of make a conscious decision about the trade-off and you know, what is that you actually care about and want. Um, so to conclude, um, Bayesian optimization has been reinvented from a historical point of view over and over, over the last 50 years, many times. And you can find Bayesian optimization after uh, in a lot of different names. Krieging, optimum experimental design, uh, efficient global optimization, um, this is essentially all Bayesian optimization, and you can consider it uh, essentially as a continuous version of the multi-arm bandit problem uh, that will be uh, discussed more in details tomorrow. So um, at the same time, Bayesian optimization can also be considered a policy search algorithm, which means that it's essentially reinforcement learning, uh, although in the general case, it's stateless. Uh, so let me get to the last thing, which is important, limitation of Bayesian optimization. Um, 
Bayesian optimization is great if you have less than 30 parameters, but above 30 parameters is going to suffer a lot. It's going to become very data inefficient. Moreover, with Bayesian optimization, since it's a global optimization, you don't have guarantees of convergence in the most general case. And finally, if the underlying function is difficult to model with the response surface that you choose, um, this is gonna cause uh, often poor results. Uh, at the same time, the advantages is that it's surprisingly efficient in many applications. It really works very well. And it's easy to incorporate more structure if you have it. And the models that you get at the end are interpretable and provide, can provide insight into the underlying function and, and the system. And finally, it works in the real world, which is really nice. I've, you know, in my career, I've never tried Bayesian optimization a problem and it would completely fail. It fairly robust as an algorithms and this is great. Um, it's also a very active search uh, topic in research. And uh, some of the you know, most important challenges are, for example, how to scale it to hundreds or thousands of parameters uh, and generally how to design better acquisition functions. So to summarize, Bayesian optimization is a popular tool for global optimization of expensive black box function. And during the lecture of today, I essentially presented the standard Bayesian optimization notation, presented the, uh, very briefly the algorithms and its component, discussed the, some special instance of BO, described its strength and limitation, and showed you a couple of real world uh, applications. And I'm now gonna take questions. And also, if you have feedback about the lecture, please go to the website and feel free to you know, leave me feedback. And since I'm late, I'm also happy to stay longer for, to take questions.